We're recording. Hey, welcome to the weekly in web browsers and IPFS GUI sync call. Uh, uh, a light agenda today, but some fantastic people in the room. So let us begin with a round of what you've done last week, what you're going to do next week. At the top of the bill, as always, is Lytle. Uh, I'll try to make it more interesting this week. So, uh, and I'll just mention th th two things. One is that we have a privacy policy uh, for IPFS Companion. Uh, it was sort of suggested during the review at the Mozilla add-on store. And the current version is already reviewed by our legal team. Uh, it explains some like details around what data goes where and for how long can it be cached and stuff like that with some additional privacy considerations if you want to upload sensitive data to IPFS. Um, yep, uh, so that's uh, one thing. And another is that I made an initial stab at uh, making gateway redirects, uh, making possible to opt out from gateway redirect per website. And what I mean by website is basically for a specific origin all the sub resources loaded on the page. So not only the same domain, not only all the subdomains, but basically all the sub resources on the root page, uh, you are now able in this uh, branch, you're able to opt out. And to avoid confusion, uh, I also moved the global toggle uh, to an icon. And uh, there's a PR with some GIFs, but I think I should be able to make a demo. Uh, quickly, let me start. Yep. So, apologies for a uh, big resolution, but what can you do? Uh, all right, so you let's open like a uh, docs portal. Our docs portal is uh, on the IPNS, it's a DNS linked page. And you can see uh, here I have additional icon to disable redirect globally, which changes the default gateway like, to the public gateway and back to the local gateway. But what's interesting is that in the place when you had before you had uh, like a global toggle, you are able to disable redirect only for this one website. And here you can see the domain from the DNS link. And if we disable the redirect for this uh, DNS link uh, uh, domain, we go back in the location bar to the docs uh, URL. And here you can see there's an option to restore redirects back. And we are back to the local gateway. Uh, so the part that's a bit crude is this, like this dotted section. I just make it uh, like super obvious that those menu items are specific for the current, like to the active tab. Because uh, we had like in past, we had those options uh, basically merged together with those two. Uh, so that's something we probably should like improve this visual language. One of ideas I had is to like add some additional counters. For example, we could count how many re sub resources on the page were re redirected to local gateway and display this like button only when there were like actually any re resources redirected. So on most of websites that uh, do not have any IPFS resources, it would like we would not have this section, let's say like, uh, Yeah, so like here we are able to like disable redirect, but there were no IPFS resources. Uh, yeah, so that's that. And uh, so that was a demo for like DNS link uh, websites, but I also have like a quick demo of uh, another thing that uh, got fixed by this. And basically it's uh, an opt out on regular websites. So some people reported that uh, IPFS Companion breaks DTube, mostly because they have like a, their own uh, 
content routing uh, on, uh, based on their own public gateways and uh, JS APFS. Uh, so you can see like right now, APFS companion is enabled and the page did sort of stuck, did not, does not load. Uh, so I disable redirects on, only on this one website and it automatically reloaded the page with those new rules. So the redirect is disabled and you can see like the video uh, started playing. Uh, so that's like a nice uh, fix for the situation when people been disabling redirect globally because only one website did not work with IPFS companion. Uh, another idea is to add like an option here uh, to report that companion uh, broke some website. Uh, not sure if like how to uh, how useful that would be but it would for sure uh, maybe give us more data points how people are using ipfs in a way that does not uh, work with companion uh, so i think that's that if you are interested in details and like what's remain so there's uh, like some stuff uh, that remains to be done before this pr is ready to merge but basically uh, i would appreciate feedback on uh, the UX side mostly to make it like very, <laughs> very intuitive to people what is happening. And I stop sharing now. That is very cool. I also like it when there's multiple cursors on the screen at the same time. That's very good. Um, any questions for Lido? Oh, okay. Um, oh, Chris Waring, go for it. Um, one question, actually, not so much about the, the cool new uh, add-on you just added, but the, the privacy policy. Um, is that just for data storage in IPFS, not for how IPFS works with additional tracking? And oh, it's on, oh, it's uh, basically only, only for our browser extension. It's, it's, like, it's not a, a general privacy policy for IPFS as a project. It's only for browser extension. And it was created mostly because uh, some add-on stores, for example, the one for Firefox uh, hosted by Mozilla, they require a privacy policy. And uh, during manual review, a person is reading the privacy policy and is verifying if the extension does what privacy policy says it does. So uh, it's only for IPFS companion. And what IPFS companion does is basically either redirecting uh, to your local gateway in that case, we, we don't care what happens next, but if you run the embedded node, then that node may be connecting to uh, some servers over WebSockets that belongs to protocol labs. And some data may be cached for some time on servers that belong to protocol labs or some other people, because uh, it's like peer-to-peer, like -peer, so your friend may have some uh, uh, data that you've uploaded so those, uh, like this kind of information is in the current version of uh, privacy policy, just to uh, sort of uh, set the stage for users to better understand what's happening and what are like privacy considerations. We mentioned that if you, like data is public by default on IPFS, and if you want to share some sensitive data, you need to encrypt before uploading to IPFS, so stuff like that. And it's only like pro for this browser extension. We don't have uh, any uh, tracking yet. Uh, the, like the metrics uh, will be in web UI, but we no longer ship uh, web UI with IPFS companion. So we basically have a single sentence that we don't like gather any metrics uh, by the extension itself. So that's that. Awesome, cheers for the clarification. And uh, it's a good reminder that I uh, need to ping legal to sort out a privacy policy for web UI and desktop. Um, okay, next up, Diogo. You got anything to demo? What's cool? Okay. Uh, not really, don't have anything to demo because I'm still working on the, the files list, the refactoring. I basically spent my whole week banging my head against the wall because nothing was working. But then all they came to the rescue and then blocked me with some stuff. Uh, well, I can, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I could, I could. if it's working, then no one else has seen 
uh, it's kind of it's kind of working. It's, yeah. Okay. It's a work in progress. Yeah. So what's the, what's what's the what's the goal for the piece of work? Okay. The goal of this is so we can have a huge file list and browse browse that list with no problem. We're using React virtualized for that. Um, these are a uh, few files, but some things that were broken and now, now are working, the, the upper there stuff, this was completely broken, now it's fine. Uh, the checkboxes are working too. And I'm almost finishing the, the keyboard navigation. So this is kind of working too. Just, for example, one of the, the, the things that's not working and is working, when we scroll down, this is surely is pretty laggy for you guys, but when we scroll down, if I deselect everything and then I try to select a file with the keyboard, it's going to break. Why is that? It breaks because I'm trying to access a, a file that is not in the DOM because of React virtualized. So what I'm uh, thinking of doing right now is uh, basically wherever uh, in any situation of the list, when I press key, key down or key up, I'll select the first file that is on view. In the production version of the web UI, we're always selecting the first file of the list. And I don't think that's correct. Imagine we're on the, the bottom of the list. If we try to select a file, it's all, always going to be the first one selected. So the window will scroll through every file to the first one. Are you guys uh, getting my points? I don't totally understand, but that's okay. For the, scope, sure. for the scope of this call, I understand that uh, uh, using the keyboard navigation is not so good, certainly not with like selecting things. Yeah, it's not that good, but it's going to be good. I think that's the point I'm trying to <laughs> I think um, one problem with the old one was that we were just storing rest all over the place and that's a terrible pattern and an even worse pattern once we are virtualizing the viewports such that refs are going to disappear once they scroll out of view. Yeah, but yeah, but <clears throat> you, you said to me to, I tried to, this week I tried to use the auto key, I don't know, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, so React Virtualize has a built-in notion of being able to step through a virtualized list uh, with via keyboard controls. Yeah. But uh, that's only for navigation. As we have uh, lots of functions, we have navigation, we have uh, selections, we have uh, renaming, deletion, everything with the keyboard. I tried using the React Virtualize tool, but that's not working. So I'm doing everything natively, and I'm still going to use refs, but I'm going to clean them as, as the files are disappearing from the DOM. Are you okay with that, Oli? Because I know you said you didn't want refs, but I, I found that this was the, the best solution. Okay. So okay. I'm going. I'd be uh, outside of this call. I'd be curious to know why just using state isn't sufficient. Okay. Um, yeah, we can talk about that. Later. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Um, so the good news, the good news is that the fundamental part is now working. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> the the virtualization of the long file list wasn't there last week and is there this week. And hopefully we'll be shipped next week. Yeah. I feel like I'm working on this for ages. It was always going to be tricky because uh, we'd thrown a lot of functionality into the file list, assuming that it was going to be a static long list. Uh, and then we tried to render a thousand things and it was dog slow. So. Yeah. It doesn't sound very interplanetary. So we have to virtualize. That sounds interplanetary. <laughs> pia, pia, pia. Um, okay. Any questions for Diego? No. Okay. Uh, Enrique can't join us. Um, so I will just quickly, the highlights from, from him, I think, are the release of the RC1 of 0.7 IPFS desktop, um, mainly bug fixes and uh, official 
developer certificates for Apple and Windows are the most significant things. Um, but, but, but we also have done a first pass inside IPFS desktop. It, when you first run it, it will initialize an IPFS repository for you if you don't have one. And when we have that opportunity, we are now customizing the IPFS config to behave more sensibly for uh, an average desktop user's experience. So assuming that you're, uh, you know, you're a laptop and you go offline a lot, um, and that you're not running IPFS desktop on your home server, uh, it's tuned to have uh, uh, a lower maximum connections. So by default, IPFS Connection Manager uh, has a range of about like high watermark is 600. So if you find more than 600 peers, it'll start proactively pruning them down to below 600. Um, and a low watermark of about 300. So it's gonna try and keep adding peers until it gets over 300. Um, for desktop, we bring that right down to between, I think low watermark is 50 connections and the high watermark is 200. Um, but we have a higher grace period. Uh, so the grace period is used to prevent thrashing of connections. So no connection will be pruned within the grace period duration. So if you connect to someone, if you connect to your, 201st uh, swarm peer, that connection will remain for at least five minutes. So anyway, uh, the main point is that it's been tuned to behave like a good desktop node, not a server. Uh, that, that seems like uh, a useful step forward. This is in lieu of having an actual IPFS desktop profile. Uh, you can pass flags, you can pass a profile flag, flag to the IPFS daemon. Um, but it doesn't yet have a desktop profile. So we're initially doing that work in customized config. Someone has poked the chat. Dirty disturbance. Is it rustling on my face? Outrageous. Um, the main reason for the RC1 uh, suffix on the release is also uh, today or tomorrow, we're going to pu push out an RC.2 so that we can, amongst the GUI team and the Imbro Browsers team, test that the auto update procedure is working better than it did for the jump from 0.6 to 0.7. There were, there were a couple of problems with the auto update with that. One was we didn't have dev certs, which meant that the OSX experience basically didn't work. Uh, we also were trying to do the update silently in the background, which failed terribly. Um, so this has switched it to a more proactive. While the app is running, it will periodically check for updates and it will um, show a notification in the, in the UI, so a little pop-up, it'll say there's a new version of the app, would you like to install it? So then it's a more proactive user-initiated action, whereas before it would wait until you were shutting down the app, which, because it's a taskbar long-running process, would only happen when you shut down your system, and the timing of events for, like, for any app during OS shutdown is pretty racy, and for Electron apps particularly, like they have limited, like, Getting it right cross cross platform is was a bag of snakes, so it didn't make any sense anyway. Uh, so we've simplified that. Um, that's Enrique's update. Uh, I have nothing exciting to show, but I'm very very close to having the uh, IPFS cluster and Circle CI based website deploy process running. Basically, we were leaning on Jenkins. The short story is. Jenkins was being super slow for all the other teams, whereas the GUI team was just using Jenkins to do website deploys. So for us, it hadn't, there was no problems because we weren't leaning on it for our testing. Um, we've shut down Jenkins org wide pretty like, abruptly, uh, which means the one benefit that we were getting out of it, we are no longer receiving. So I am, um, there's a whole bunch of work that we did to uh, update the IPLD Explorer and uh, Diogo fixed a load of bugs and did a load of updating. I fixed a load of bugs, did a load of updating, and we were just about to deploy it, and then Jenkins went away. So now I am uh, rushing to get the Circle CI based blessed deployment process uh, in place. Um, and in the background, we're still very, very close to having our own uh, hosted Countly based analytics system. So this is, we want to get useful metrics across IPFS web UI and IPFS desktop about 
numbers of users and what features they find useful. It's all totally anonymized uh, telemetry. There's no personal stuff in there. Um, but we don't want to throw all that information at Google Analytics. We want to uh, own that data and not, you know, so that we can verify that it's not being used for anything untoward and it's just for the developers to make better, more informed decisions about which features of the app are actually being useful and which aren't getting used and use that to drive better decisions. Anyway, I've been talking about that for months. It's now gone through legal, it's gone through finance, it's gone through uh, infrastructure. Things are getting signed uh, next week. It's going to get demoed. Um, I've got the faith. Anywho, I've spoken for too long. Next up, Jim, would you like to give us a demo? Do you got anything to share with the crowd? Um, I'll stop screen sharing. Just a really... Okay. okay, so this is the, the most minimal demo ever. So, so this is my demo. So this is the Peridium um, demo that Gozala did. Um, and I modified it so I published straight, um, published like a static version of the web page to IPFS. So it push, pu pushed it to my local IPFS, but I added this. Um, I, I was showing this last week where it had the pinning status, but now you get the little check box, checkbox. What, a, what, is local, what does local IPFS mean in this situation? So with Lunet, um, I'm running um, an IPFS daemon on my laptop. And um, so it got pinned to that. Um, but if I close my laptop, it's not going to be uh, available on the network anymore. So where I really want the, it to be pinned is in IPFS cluster. So I have this uh, iframe running in behind here. Let's see. Can I make this minimize? <laughs> um, this is this is synchronized with the iframe, and when you pin something, it it, it puts in the the CID into the iframe, and then iframe is running peer base, so it gets synchronized um, as part of this peer base collaboration, and then on my ma machine at home, I have. Um, a little Node.js program I'm running, which also joined the collaboration and watches for any pins. And it just relays the pin over to uh, IPFS cluster, which I have one running at home. So, so the point is, it's just um, as a user, I don't really have to know that there's a pinner running or that there's a little iframe running, uh, hidden iframe. Um, all I have to know is, you know. So. So this is a new document, you know, is it going to be saved forever? Well, it may not be forever, but it's like whatever the policy is of the IPFS cluster. Um, so, so it's sort of a nice flow because uh, um, you can pretty much build any type of publishing app. And as long as it can relay messages to uh, a hidden iframe or some service, um, you can uh, keep keep the, the data alive. So, um, and uh, apart from that, uh, I, I'm in Portland this week. So I went for coffee with uh, um, Arakli Gozala. And so I picked his brains on what he's planning to do with Lunet. So, Pretty interesting stuff. It's um, hard, hard to under like I was reading through the source code, and he's doing like so many, using so many uh, browser API features. I had no idea any of these things existed. It was really interesting trying to pick that code apart. Um, but this, this is actually using the older his his code from last week, but his new new code uh, falls back to JS IPFS. So if you're not Running a local IPFS daemon, which you know most people aren't going to be, um, it'll still work because the GS IPFS. So, I like the idea that uh, Gozala is moving so quickly that this is based off some weak old stuff. It's not even relevant anymore. <laughs> um, very cool. 
Uh, Hugo Diaz, how are you doing? Oh, sorry, I used, should have used his full name, Hugo Fancy Mr. Diaz. Is he, does, are you reading us? Oh no, I, I can't hear you, Hugo. Oh, there you go. Zoom is telling me that my internet is unstable, so bear with me. So, I've been doing a lot of uh, Travis things, as you all know, probably. So, I added Travis to a couple of repos, um, helped debug some stuff normally Windows related on IPLD repos. I just finished adding support to Azure for bundle size checking uh, and also added that check to a, a one repo, the IPFSD CTL. Let me just share my screen. <coughs> So, uh, just to show you what this looks like, uh, we actually get a nice check uh, right in the PR telling you all about your bundle size and uh, when this pull request gets um, merged, we'll get an extra little bit of information here about the difference between the pull request and master, just like uh, this. And if you click it, you get a nice page telling you basically the same thing, so not really useful, but the check itself in the repo, I think, will um, give more visibility about at least uh, so people uh, start looking at the size and care much about it. So this thing should be. Just as a, a quick addendum to that, uh, we've been using that on um, IPFS WebUI and IPFS Desktop and various GUI team repos for a good few months now. And it has really helped. Like it's caught a bunch of things like when we were bundling IPLD into the main bundle for the web app and we didn't spot it and we should have been lazy importing IPLD and things like that. Um, and just like when we've added a, a dependency that has blown out the size of the bundle, um, it's been really helpful. Yeah. But now I have a big problem. Uh, as you can see in this public quest, the CI fails. And why does it fail? Because the Windows VMs on Travis don't, do not support secrets. And to be able to add bundle size, I need to add a secret authorizing the bundle size service to access stuff. So either we have bundle size or we have Windows. Uh, I'm trying to find out a way to just like remove the secret for the Windows job, but I'm still waiting on the support. So this will probably get a little bit uh, paused until I figure out how to handle that. Uh, so more stuff. Uh, I really would appreciate if you could look at these two links on the blocks section. Uh, the first one is the move to Travis tracking issue. So if you maintain any repos or want to help to move a uh, repo to Travis, you will find all the information there and just pick one that it's not in the list yet and just uh, do it yourself. Uh, the second one is a, a thread talking about adding the package lock of JSON. Um, one of the main things that we want to accomplish with this is imp improving the um, the build uh, the build times or the job times in Travis, uh, so we get more from the resources we have right now. 
and also to help a little bit uh, on catching the dependencies that bubble up and breaks things, even if the semantic versioning uh, update is just a patch. But this uh, adding the package log also has some disadvantages. So if you go to the issue, everything is explained. Um, uh, some workarounds are being explored. So your feedback is welcome there too. Uh, and for the rest of the week, I will try to figure out the bundle size checks um, and add it to more repos and finish the benchmarks integration into the CI. I will probably also will have uh, more repos or issues uh, about windows and line endings. So I'll probably do that also. But yeah, that's it for me. All right, thank you very much. Um, that's everyone, unless, Chris, do you want to give us like a dazzling, give us a sneak peek, sneak peek, sneaky peek. Chris, wearing, have you got anything cool that you want to give us a sneak peek of? I don't know what you're talking about. It's, it's uh, not official. No. All right. <laughs> no, I can't. I, Chris is working on a cool website that we might see next week. To be continued, but also yeah, some design systems that will become part of IPFS as well. I'm sure. Cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so bon, but we'll have more excitement about that next week. Uh, to the agenda. And um, if anyone's got anything else they want to talk about, they should add it to the agenda now. But in the meantime, we would really like Enrique to be able to join these calls as he is one of the founder members of the IPFS GUI team. But he is also at university and he has classes right now, which is why he's not here. So um, there is a poll to decide when to move it to. Um, please vote if you haven't already, um, because I think, did was there a winner from the poll, Martin? Yeah, it's like a lot of winners. <laughs> mm, seems just terrible all around. Don't move calls. Um, da, 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 da. What would happen if we move the call to this time? tomorrow would everyone would everyone who's on the call right now be able to come to the same call at the same time on a Thursday Chris wearing his hand uh, IPFS community one is overlapping with that ah the IPFS community one well, we don't really want to overlap with that yeah okay but maybe prior to that um, the plan was to announce a call change on this call. So it sounds like we don't have consensus about moving to any particular other time yet. So I think we're going to have to defer the call change for another week. Wah, wah, wah. Which is fine. Stability is great. Um, and we'll gradually forget what Enrique looks like, but we'll get him to send photos and gifts. Maybe he could record video messages. That would be great. Video update. Yeah. Um, okay, so the call is going to be the same time, same place next week, and we shall try again to reschedule then. But we'll try and do it before the call and just make an announcement if it's going to happen. Um, Vital, you already did your demo, or have you got another demo? I can do it again. <laughs> no, I did already it. did it. Yeah. That's super cool. Well, guess what, guys? We've been so efficient that you can have 19 minutes of your life back, unless there's anything you want to talk about. Got any burning issues? Think. I want to get to it because I'm tired of lining <coughs> the windows and CIs. So one article that got published uh, recently from this guy. Yes, uh, sorry, I forget to share my screen. You see it now, this guy? So oh, yeah. Yeah, sort of. He works for Google, and does some cool stuff in there, and he published this article. So basically, 
uh, I don't know if you know the school school app that they published uh, it has something to do with images and yeah it's, an, it's a compressor images. so it, yeah it runs like ping squash and um, various yeah. image compression algorithms in your browser yeah everything in the browser so the main point of the article is not like to explain the app but to uh, talk a little bit about uh, WebAssembly and all that jazz. So the cool thing that I want to explore a little bit is they explain everything in really, uh, in really, in really nice uh, with really nice examples and and everything. Basically, they want to make this piece of code uh, into was, uh, but using at least three different options, like going from C, C++ to WASM, um, from Rust to WASM, and from one new thing that I didn't know, but actually pretty cool, um, which is that it's called AssemblyScript. So AssemblyScript is basically TypeScript. Uh, and the main difference between these two is that like uh, the standard library of uh, like ECMAScript is a little bit modified so they can easily uh, transpile to WASM. So this is uh, like, uh, could be really useful to do a quick or uh, quick test to see if some of the, of our, dependencies that are basically math can be Im uh, improved using assembly script uh, because basically we, we can just like copy paste uh, the code from say more more hashing uh, into assembly script file run the compiler and get a was then we would get like uh, the same performance or theoretically the same performance in all the browsers plus node uh, possibly some speed improvements and all that stuff so this is basically one of the things that i want to try out and also at the, at the, at the end they talk a little bit about rust and all the tools uh, and, how, and how can you just use stuff that's in cargo and get uh, was it, but also not like a, a big file that you, that you we normally uh, do when you get rust was you get a big big real uh, a real big file and they talk a little bit out you can reduce the file size so you get the performance and you get the bundle size uh, small uh, assembly script um, is not always faster than Rust. Probably Rust is always the fastest one, but the, the file size is uh, really good because there's no, there's nothing else uh, coming into the the file size uh, from like the standard library from whatever language like Rust does. Uh, one of the things that always gets inside the bundle, the file size is the it's like the, the Rust printf because if you like throw an exception you need to like print stuff to the standard output so we need the printf for that and everything gets in the file size there's ways there's ways to remove that in rust but assembly script can be a really easy way to do it because it's still javascript and the file size is really small so the first step would be for me at least would be to try out and see if it's worth it and so I just wanted wanted you to, to show uh, how this looks like and talk to you a little bit about assembly script because I didn't know it and maybe you also didn't know it and now you know it. That's it. Thank you very much. This is the uh, the driving force to have some reliable CI so that we can start doing these kind of experiments. Um, right on. Anybody got anything else they want to talk about? You already know how much I like TypeScript, so that's... I was just I was thinking as he showed it, I was like, 
Chris Waring's going to be like, this is the vanguard. It's how we get it in. Um, that's, all, that's all cool. I'm, I'm aware of the fact that JSIPFS is about to do a release very soon. And Go more racy, Go IPFS is going to do a release really soon. And I really want to get all the work that we've put into web UI into those things before they release. Otherwise, we'll have to wait another three months for the next release. Um, but I am aware that I'm also blocked on things outside of our control to get to get the telemetry in place. So that is weighing on my mind. I don't have a good solution to that, but more that the excitement of we've got a batch of new releases at the door and it's the race condition of whether WebUI will get to demonstrate the fruits of its work in inside our flagship releases. Um, so there's some pressure to get that done. Is it is it just the instance that's the main bottleneck or is it the, because we've got all the... We could, yeah. so it would be nice to get what Diogo and I have been working on with the virtualized list, but it's real fiddly. And I think that Diogo is nearly done with it, but it's fiddly, so it could still take another, I'm not gonna say it because I'll demoralize Diogo. It's nearly done. Um, but in theory, we could cut a release without that in, but it would be a shame to cut a release, another release without telemetry in because like tracking metrics for adoption of IPFS is like a big goal for this year. And to wait another three months to get that rolled out would be a shame. I mean, it's, you know, if you've got do not track enabled in your browser, it's, we're not going to get any telemetry anyway, but it will then say, would you like to help? It's got an opt in, like, would you like to help, help us? So I'd like to get that in, but I can't roll it out until the thing is deployed. Uh, there's a lot can't of we throw the metrics in the void, uh, even if the instance is not there? Chris, and then when it Chris um, Waring, Chris Waring, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're worth it. That's it. That's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to roll it out and be like, if it's not there, just ignore it. It's fine. Perfect. I don't see any downsides of that. Cool. That's what I'm going to do. Anything else? Well. 10 minutes back of your day. Go enjoy decentralizing the internet. Way. This has been the weekly in web browsers and IPFS GUI sync up. And I'll see you here same time, same place next week because we didn't make time to change the time. So it's going to be at the same time. Laters. Ciao. Bye, guys. Bye.